Hey everyone, Thomas DeLauer here. In today's video, we're going over three steps to fix your gut. So these three things will work great individually, but they work really well if you do them in sequence. So I'm gonna go through how fasting a strategic amount of times per week can be very beneficial, then some specific foods that you wanna add in after doing those fasts, and then things you need to avoid, okay? So let's go ahead and let's jump right in. But first, please do make sure you hit that red subscribe button, and please do hit that little bell icon so you can turn on notifications so you never miss our daily videos. So first and foremost, yes, you probably watch this channel because you're into fasting, or maybe you've heard about intermittent fasting. Thing is, it is more than just a tool to lose weight. It is hugely beneficial when it comes down to your gut microbiome, which quite frankly, in my opinion, is everything. Okay, so bad bacteria tend to have a shorter doubling time. So what that means is when you go without food for a period of time, you generally will kill off bad bacteria first. They take longer to actually double. They take longer to multiply. So if you go a longer period of time, like fasting, without food, they will die before the good bacteria do. Now, this hypothetically, in this case, is a short-term situation, right? I say hypothetically because this is proven in some clinicals, but not entirely, and I'm very, very honest with that. So it's a short-term fix because eventually bacteria are just gonna end up coming back and causing an issue and come with a vengeance. But if we look at this, Scandinavian Journal of Immunology published a study that found that alternate day fasting cleared pathogenic bacteria. So they found, simply put, that when people would do alternate day fasting, fast one day, then not fast, then fast, they ended up clearing out salmonella and other bad bacteria much faster than those that weren't, showing that, hey, there you go, bad bacteria tend to die off. So maybe it is more than just short term. They also found there's elevated levels of immunoglobulin A, which plays a big role in the gut mucosal layer. So if we're looking at the effect of the gut mucosal layer on protecting our gut and protecting our good bacteria and staving off bad, that's exactly what we want. We want elevated immunoglobulin A. Now I know it's scientific and medical, but immunoglobulin A just plays a role in the right antibodies and the right immune response that is correlated with our gut. It's all a balance there. Your gut bacteria is out of whack, your immune system's out of whack. Then we look at another study that was published in the journal Cell Metabolism, found that alternate, whoops, little typo there, alternate day fasting alters the gut biome to promote the beijing of white fat. What that simply means, this is a great body composition effect, the beijing of white fat means that white fat is taking on attributes of brown fat. Brown fat is the fat that actually stimulates thermogenesis. It creates body heat and it allows us to utilize calories as heat rather than store them. So brown fat's great for, well, burning fat. But what that proves to us is that the gut biome plays a significant role in our fat tissue. And fasting plays a role in the gut biome, which indirectly and directly is affecting our fat tissue. Therefore proving, yes, fasting affects the gut biome. Now, this does this via a unique pathway, and this is nerdy here for a second. It's called the upregulation of gene coding from a specific gene, MCT1. This is only for you science nerds, just stick with me for one second. Basically, it upregulates the fermenting compounds in the gut. So when we fast, fermenting compounds like lactate increase, causing more digestion and more bacteria proliferation of good bacteria. Pretty intriguing stuff. So what you'd want to do, you don't have to necessarily alternate day fast, but say fast for 18 or 20 hours on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Nothing crazy, you still get to eat dinner, you still get to eat potentially lunch. You're not fasting for the full day. This is very entry level, very simple that anyone can do. And this is a rehab method. You don't have to do this forever if you don't want to. Then we move on to number two, which is adding prebiotics and bone broth and the right resistant starches, which we will discuss in a little bit here. The fermentation of prebiotics leads to short chain fatty acids. If you watch enough of my videos, you'll notice that this is a common theme. Short chain fatty acids are the fully digested, broken down pieces of fiber and some fats. They serve as a fuel for the gut cells literally a fuel for them, which we'll talk about in a second. We want these short chain fatty acids known as butyrate, very powerful. So what happens is when we break down specific fibers, they get broken down by different bacteria into this butyrate. It's crazy, it's the end product. It's the end result of bacteria having a feeding frenzy on fiber. Now, we have inulin, we have resistant starches, and I'm gonna list off a few that I recommend. Resistant starches are starches, not even fibers really, that don't break down. And I highly, highly recommend that you get some of these powders or do something, find them online, you can find them. Okay, like raw potato powder, you can get green banana fiber, green banana powder, stuff like that. Okay, chicory root is a different one, that's actually a fiber. Um, then we have 
garlic, eating lots of garlic, asparagus, artichoke, tremendous prebiotics. The resistant starches, I have other videos, I'll link out to them down below. That's a whole fascinating world in and of itself. Literally starches that just don't break down, but they feed the gut bacteria. Just wild stuff. Now before I get into this little scientific section here, let me give you a little bit of a protocol of what you'd want to do. So if you fast three days per week, on the days that you don't fast, you'd want to be consuming a high amount of prebiotic veggies. Simply put, what's going to happen is the bad bacteria is going to die off during your fast, leaving you with good bacteria. Then you feed it the prebiotics. So then you're pouring gasoline on a fire, so to speak, in a good way, of the existing bacteria that you already have. So you kill off the bad. This is all just exaggerated, kill off the bad, leaving you only with good, and then you feed the good so it upregulates and elevates, and then that ratio of good to bad is even better. Then you fast again, more bad bacteria dies, you're left with more good, and you feed it again. Eventually, you're feeding up a bunch of good bacteria, leaving yourself with a great ratio of good to bad. Now, from a genetic level, butyrate acts as what is called a histone deacetylase inhibitor. I'll keep this short. It basically means at a genetic level, it supports the stem cell production of gut cells. So the more fiber you eat, the more short-chain fatty acids, the more you have an actual genetic effect. The cells of the colon, like I said before, 70% of the energy that they get comes from that short-chain fatty acid. Then I recommend that you have bone broth. And this comes as the healing side of things. You can even break your fast with the bone broth. You see, the bone broth provides gelatin, which is a hydrophilic colloid, which means it draws water into the mucosal layer to protect it more. So now you've got this great, happy, healthy gut biome, protect it. Protect that ecosystem with a good gut lining. FYI, a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about here, with the exception of like fresh veggies, you can get at Thrive Market. Talk about them all the time. They are a big sponsor of this channel, so a big thank you to Thrive Market, an online membership-based grocery store. So after you watch this video, check them out. There's a special link down below that can get you access to specific boxes that I've created for fasting and everything like that with my recommended groceries. You definitely don't wanna miss out on that. Check them out, and big thank you, Thrive Market, for extending this out to everyone that watches my videos. Now we have to jump over to what you need to avoid. Okay, very sketchy stuff here, but really cutting edge science. And one particular study that really blew me away. Sugar, we know that sugar's bad, but did you know that it could be changing your whole gut biome? Here's where it gets wild, and I can do more videos on this. 2019 PNAS study found that there is evidence that sugar acts as a signal that impedes proteins that allow bacterial growth. Why is that fascinating? Because now sugar is not just a macronutrient. Sugar is not just a carbohydrate anymore. We're seeing that sugar is a signaling device that is signaling different processes in our body. Whoa, maybe we're starting to uncover that all foods could be potential signaling devices, not just fuel. So sugar signals the body to shut down proteins that would normally allow our bacteria to grow. Holy cow. Now, another piece that you have to be very careful with is artificial sweeteners. Journal Nature 2014, this is one of my favorite studies out there, found that when they fed mice saccharin, sucralose, or aspartame, the mice developed glucose intolerance. Well, what does that mean? What does that have to do with the gut bacteria? Well, when they took that bacteria out of that mice and put it into different mice, those mice developed glucose intolerance, proving two things. One, that gut bacteria does affect our actual glucose intolerance and our ability to digest carbs. But secondly, that gut bacteria is clearly affected by artificial sweeteners, making us intolerant to glucose. This is bad news. This is actually really scary stuff. We need to be very cautious of that. More and more evidence coming out. Keep it with stevia, keep it with monk fruit whenever you can. Erythritol, actually okay too, because erythritol is technically indigestible, can actually contribute to the growth of good bacteria if done right. Here's what's wild. They also did this in humans, where for one week, they had people consume artificial sweeteners that didn't normally. Well, four out of seven people developed glucose intolerance. So it's not just in mice, it's in people too. Another thing you need to avoid, gluten. Purely put, gluten is indigestible. It doesn't break down, which means it can trigger inflammation within the gut, especially those that are a little bit more sensitive. Not necessarily celiac, people that are just more sensitive to gluten because there has been such an overconsumption of it. Plenty of videos on that. Lastly, alcohol. Alcohol breaks down a lot of the microbiome. Plain and simple, we don't need to dive into that in a whole lot more detail. I'll see you tomorrow.